the Air Global Radio Network. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be with you today. It's raining, rolling thunder in Southwest Florida. We may or may not lose the lights and the internet. If we do, we'll be back. One of my favorite writers is here today, John Gelstrap. And I have known each other since 2013 when he and one of his best friends, Revis Wortham, who you know has been on this show before, kind of took me under their wing and guided me around Thriller Fest and introduced me to other authors. Since then, I've been a huge fan of John's writing and Revis's too. John, welcome back to Authors on the Air. It's great to be here on National Nude Day. I'm telling you. No clothes you know, required. I chose I, to wear them, you know, they, I, it's, it's amazing. Well. And I actually covered up extra just in case. You know? <laughs> I was a little nervous. I thought, here, do I need to loan you my sweater? You know, <laughs> but, but yes. And I did post that, by the way, that it was National Nudes Day. So who, who would have thunk it? So right. thank you for sharing. So, John, this year you did something you normally don't do is you came out with two books. I hope you can see them, everyone. Crimson Phoenix and Stealth Attack. Oh my God, if any of you have never read a John Gilstrap book, it's like putting yourself in the seat of, I don't know, the fastest thing on earth. And then someone's saying, go! And that's it. And for 400 pages, that's exactly how it is. You do not stop. You don't take a breath. This is the Jonathan Grave series. We're going to talk about this second because this book came out first, and this is Crimson Phoenix. This is a standalone, not from any of your, your characters. Let's talk about where this idea came from. I kind of know, but it's a really, really different from what you really write. Well, it is different, and it's intentionally different. You know, not that I love Jonathan Grave, and I, and I love writing those books, but you know, I'm I'm a child of the '60s and right. of of the '70s and the Cold War and and all of this. And I guess it was three years ago, uh, my wife and I took a vacation out to the Greenbrier in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, which is a gorgeous old school hotel. I mean, just spectacular. It's like Stephen King's, you know, the Overlook Hotel. It's just it's right. Massive. And what you find out and what we found out while we were visiting is that from the 50s until the early 90s, it was the U.S. government relocation center. And That's what that bunkers, means right? is yeah, yeah that, that, that half of the hotel or a good portion of the hotel, um, the West Virginia wing is what it was called, was um, hollowed out into the mountain to serve as a bunker where the uh, House and Senate would go in the event of a nuclear war. Well, I just thought that was really cool. And then I found out that each member of Congress was allowed to bring themselves and one staff member, but they couldn't bring any family. And I'm very, you know, I'm a devoted family guy. That's I know you you know, are. Family is first in, in everything. I thought, well, sure. who would do that? So that was the seed for what became um, Crimson Phoenix, as I imagined this single mom uh, she's a widow. Her husband was killed in battle and she's got three kids and two of them are with her and one of them is away at school. And a balloon goes up on, on this war and she just refuses to go into the bunker uh, without her kids. And, and it turns out that she is one of those um, unique leaders. In my life, I always found there's two kinds of leaders. One is the ones that have the title or the stars or, you know, but the, the trappings of, 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 of leadership, of right. Official leadership. Right. And then there are those who are really, leaders that people just follow. And even though Victoria has quit Congress and she's off on her own, she turns out to be the one that, that people turn to. And so Crimson Phoenix is the first in what will be, at least be a trilogy. I just finished Blue Fire, which is which is the second one will come out in, in March. And then uh, the one after that, I think I'm going to call it White Smoke, uh, just red, white, and blue and, and all of that. But it's been a hoot to, to write it, and it's been very well received, actually. I'm, I'm, very I'm, I'm loving this book. I mean, I'm, I'm big on dystopian books, although I didn't know that's what it was going to be, you know, when. And it's really not, but it's kind of sort of is a little bit. It's post-apocalyptic anyway. So I'm really enjoying it a lot. Thank you for writing this. Now, where did the title come from? I needed, you know, it's funny, so much of this is happenstance, right? It's right. I needed something strong, a code phrase that 
would mean, you know, the balloon is going up. Right. And, you know, I didn't want to do Zulu. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. And I thought Crimson Phoenix. I just thought it was originally Crimson Dragon. And then kind of realized that that has, that implies fantasy science fiction stuff. So we went away from that and became Crimson Phoenix. It's and a great title for a great book. I like the cover too. I'm going to show everybody again. I've got to move back because otherwise I'm sitting right on my screen. Here it is. Um, this book is put out by Kensington, John's longtime publisher. And um, it is available in stores and online. Uh, of course, I hope you get a chance to visit an indie store. Have you done any book signings at all, John? in person not as you not as we know them to be i mean there, there's a bookstore one more page books and more in arlington um was was doing autograph books or autograph copies of uh, crimson phoenix but you know what it is they take the orders and then i drove in and literally signed in my car right uh because right. the stores are closed so so not really yes i signed books but there was no book signing right do you miss having people attend a book launch Oh God, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, every for see, I'm, I've done 24 books now. So for 22 of them, we have always had a big blowout book party. You know, we'd either rent a venue or we'd have people to the house, and we'd have a couple hundred people and sell a bunch of books and and um, maybe imbibe in a couple of adult beverages. And it was always it was always a hoot, and it was sort of it was a rite of 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 the year. You know, it was just, sure. And, and it and it went away. I've desperately missed that. Yeah, I, I as a reader, that the reader that I am, miss those events so much. Even the one where I live in Southwest Florida, we have the Southwest Readers Fest. It's put on by our library system that's one of the finest in the country. I have to give them kudos for doing an exceptional job. But they bring in authors from all over the world. And um, I, last year, was it last year? No, year before, I think. No. Last year in March was the last book event I went to before we were on lockdown. Eric Larson was here, Mark Graney, Jack Carr, you know, just as wonderful, wonderful authors were here that whom I've met sometime before and some I haven't. And, you know, I love going and chatting and it's not an overwhelmingly crowded event, but it's right on our river. So it's beautiful in, in downtown Fort Myers. I miss doing those. I miss doing those a lot. I like talking to the authors. I guess that's why I do this. <laughs> <laughs> I just like talking to people, you know? Yeah, it, I know you do. It's, it's, been, it's been a long year. I live in Virginia, so things have opened up quite a lot now. Uh, I really, I can't. Well, I can complain because I'm an author and that's what I do, but right. <laughs> I don't have a right to complain too much about the, the lockdown stuff. Things are, are coming back to normal. I think they are too, slowly. Um, you know, hope I hope everyone's being smart about how they conduct themselves. I'm not going to go to a packed concert anyplace, I'll tell you that, but I am going out with my friends. So now to get to my, like one of my most favorite series ever, the Jonathan Graves series. And by the way, thank you for the second coin in my collection. Maybe, oh, you'd, like to, welcome. maybe you'd like to tell our, our readers what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I, I have struck, if that's the right word, I guess, um, two challenge coins for the Grave series. One is for the, the series overall, and the other is for um, Hellfire, which was the previous Jonathan Grave book. <clears throat> and I, I sell them in the sense that people will donate to charity. And in this case, it's this current charity is the Scottish Rite Speech and Language Foundation. It's a Masonic organization. And you know, for 20 bucks to the organization, then I will send them a challenge coin. Now, having said that, don't do that for a while. We are in the process <laughs> of moving. My family is moving yeah. from, from this house to another. And right. there's an interstitial move that requires us to go to this little bitty apartment. And those coins didn't make the cut for, right. for that. So well, I, I have, we can do that again. I have my coin and I'm very happy of two coins now and I'm thrilled. I hope that you are coming up with more coins as, as your book collection grows, but thank you. I have that in a very sacred place on my bookcase. So oh, I'm sure. trying to look for one of those little like plastic boxes that you put baseball cards in, but I want to put coins in instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, they make them. Yeah, I know they do. So I'm going to be looking, believe me. So I want to talk about Jonathan Graves now. I, I know you're not going to believe this, but one of the reasons that I got so hooked on this series is because his 
work name, his undercover name is Scorpio. So this is the Scorpion series, and I am a Scorpio. As a matter of fact, I, in, in, in two times I've had my charts done 20 years apart by different people, and so both have said, well, you're a triple Scorpio. And I thought that was pretty cool. So when I saw that this is, you know, the Scorpion series, that's how I started reading it. And, of course, when I met you all, all those many years ago. As I said at the beginning of the show, you open the book, and the action starts right there on page one. You you don't wait around. There's no, you know, let me order a glass of water until, and, you know, and then the story's going to start. No, 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 no. The, I know when I read one of your books, I'm going to read the entire thing in one sitting, and I always do. So what some of you should know is that Jonathan Graves is the lead character and Brian Van Mulebrocky. How about that? I finally there can say There you go. It. You got finally, it. Finally, after all these years, <laughs> is his sidekick, as is Father Dom and Vinice, there who, you we, go. who we learn Mama doesn't like that name. <laughs> she calls her Venice because that's the way her that's the way her name is spelled. Let's talk about Stealth Attack because this one is a game changer for all the characters in this series, isn't it? I don't know if it's a game changer as much as it is. It, it a lot of stuff comes very close to home for Jonathan and, and the entire team. Um, Vinice's son Roman. Vinice has has been with Jonathan literally since she was born. I mean, they were they were kids together, and um, her son Roman from a from a, 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 a terrible marriage is vacationing, not really vacationing, it's a school trip down to El Paso uh, for a, a school newspaper thing. And he gets snatched up. And um, Jonathan Grave is, I mean, he's made his living as a freelance hostage rescue specialist. And um, it's its not a good idea to, uh, to kidnap Roman. Roman. We just had, um, Sarah just popped up and said that she ha loves your challenge coins. Um, oh, and, uh, yeah, I, I didn't get, I didn't get to read where she was from. I'm sorry, but hopefully, um, my producer can pop, put that back up on there if, if possible. Okay. She said, I love challenge coins. I read my first Jonathan Grave while deployed to Afghanistan. Sadly, I am a few books behind, but I love the series. Sarah Crittendoff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sarah. Right That's great. Yeah. Terrific, Sarah. Thank you. So immediately now boxers, who is uh, Jonathan's sidekick, that's his nickname, or big guy because he's almost seven feet tall, which I'm having a hard time imagining. Uh, you know, I used to go to all the Miami Heat basketball games. Uh -huh. and I'm trying to think who was the tallest guy that on the team when I used to go. I mean, that's like that's somebody who has to duck in my apartment. John, you know? <laughs> well, and that's and that's the point. And actually, boxers is very, very loosely based on a real guy. I did a book, um, got a thousand years ago, two thousand six, called Six Minutes to Freedom. It was a nonfiction book about a Delta Force operation. And at that point, as I was told, did independent verification. There's this enormous guy, and I won't mention his name because that wouldn't be fair. But he might still be active. Um, he, the tallest guy in the United States Army was a door kicker for Delta Force which was just so incongruous to me. You know, it, it's, don't you want to be the shortest guy when you're kicking doors? You certainly don't want to be the tallest guy. Yeah. And, and, and he had that droll sense of humor. And so that's where boxers came from. But he's, the character is named after someone you went to school with. Am I correct in that? Yes. Brian Van Mulebrocky was actually, you know, you, when you're writing names, don't have a lot of significance to me when I'm writing, I just need a name for something. And, and Brian Van Mulebrocky was the very first firefighter I met when I walked into my very first fire station at the beginning of my fire service time. And um, with a name like that, they actually couldn't, they couldn't fit it on his fire coat. So he went by Brian Van. Otherwise, it would, it would wrap all the way around We're his around. knees, you know. And um, so that's, that's, that's where the name comes from. But Brian, I actually have run into him just recently. Um, Brian is, I don't know, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, very normal guy who was uh, kind of shocked to find out that, that he's seven feet tall now. Did, you, did he know you were using his name in the book? No. Prior to you? No. That's so funny. That's I like so to play little Easter eggs, let people find themselves. It's, a, you know, it's a text. Yeah. So <laughs> how, did, how did you come up with Vinice and why, why does she say her name like that versus her name really is Venice? 
that's what mama named her. So did she tell me the story behind that? Cause that's something I don't know if you've ever, I mean, if you ever mentioned that one of the book, it was like a scene with no action. It was just dialogue and it may have just gone right by me. You know, it's funny. I don't know that I've ever written about it. I certainly know the story. It was a, um, a, a teenage temper tantrum where, you know, she wanted to not be ordinary and she doesn't want to be named after a city. So she decided that she would be Veniche and she just was going to call herself that as sort of this arrogance and it stuck. And her, her mother, Mama, who's named Florence, her son is named Roman. Okay. You get it? So it's, um, her, her mother just will call her Venice and everybody else calls her Veniche. Just to so throw funny. away the detail. So funny. I, I did not know that. That's um, But I think I recall you saying that she was very definite about how she wanted her name pronounced. Um, so Vinice in the book is a hacker extraordinaire. She knows how to break into anything. She's just, and she's, I think she's a white hat hacker. I mean, I, I believe she probably is. She's using it for good, not evil. Um, but uh, let's tell this story a little bit further. So Roman is on a field trip. And I have to tell you, when when the girl acts interested in him and kind of lures him away from where the field trip is supposed to be taking place, I really thought that she was intentional in doing that. And I thought, how could someone so young be that devious. That was my first thought. And when they meet their captors or see their captors for the first time, I thought, oh, she's definitely in on it. Well, you know, you threw that flounder right in my face. That was over and done with real quick. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, so, so let's talk a little bit more about this. Since this is Venice's son and Florence's grandson, I I got the impression that they may or may not want to continue with the work they're doing with Jonathan. Now, you don't imply that at all in the book. It's just, mm -hmm. it was just my natural jump forward um, because they had never personally, other than when Venice's boyfriend was killed, yep. not been, you know, it hadn't attacked them personally like that. Um, how do you think it's going to change things? Well, actually, I'm in the process of writing the next book now, so ah. I don't know yet. Um, you know, I think that fundamentally, uh, Vinice and and Jonathan have, it's not a love affair in the sexual sense, but they are really devoted to each other. Yes. And what we've established over the years is Vinice is a hacker extraordinaire. In fact, her hacking name is Freakface666, and she ran a, a, a black was a black hat, I guess, um, thing called Gloomity. And um, and she got in trouble and Jonathan got her out of trouble. This is years before any of the books start. You know, it's all backstory that's been revealed over time. So they owe each other a lot. It's like the director of the FBI, Irene Rivers, owes Jonathan a lot and oh, he yeah. owes her a lot. And so in within the 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 book, everybody acts acts outside the law. Everybody acts right. outside the law, but always for the good reason. You know, always, always for the greater good, which is the kind of good. construct of, of the whole series. So um now I don't think they're going to break apart, uh, but it's things are getting more difficult. In fact, they're getting a lot more difficult in um Lethal Prey, which will be the book comes out this time next year, which is what I'm writing right now. I'm really anxious. I wish you'd write faster, at least send me chapters or something. <laughs> I'm doing two a year. Give me a break. <laughs> just, send, just send me the chapters as you're writing, okay? And I'll just, I, I mean, I'm like this, waiting for the next book. You know, you need to have like three or four backups when, when you put one out. You're not writing fast enough. <laughs> you know, one of the things, you, not to belabor this, but one of the things that is so gratifying about what I do in conversations like this, you know, writing is, I, I, I make stuff up, right? I play with my imaginary friends and I type it onto a screen and it's, there'll be music in the background, but there's absolutely, there's no interface. And then when I, when I talk to, to people like you, and obviously you've read the books and you like the books, and it's so gratifying to realize that, you know, this stuff is kind of coming alive for people. And oh, it's, yeah. it's very, very cool. And I also want to state for the sake of the audience, um, 
there's backstory within every story, but each of the books is designed to be read as a standalone. Right. So right. you don't have to, if, if, if you want to read Stealth Attack, you don't have to go back 13 books and read all the other. I encourage you to. You absolutely <laughs> should, though. Trust me on this. I have never let you led you wrong on books. You absolutely should go back. And you actually should start with Nathan's Run, which was John's very first book, which is about, well, you tell him it's about, you wrote the darn thing. I wrote that book in 1994. It came out in 1996. So it's it's been around for a long time. Nathan Bailey is a 12-year-old boy who is in a juvenile detention center and he kills a guard and runs away. And he is being chased as a as a cop killer and a fugitive. And what nobody is realizing is that he killed in self-defense and run away might not have been smart, but that was his only choice. And he ends up calling into a radio show that is um, the, the star of the show is Denise Carpenter, but her radio name is The Bitch. And he calls into The Bitch's TV show, uh, into the radio show, and, and she's on a rant against him. And he tells his side of the story. And all of a sudden, all of the media coverage turns around on this politically ambitious prosecutor who's trying to make a name for himself. And meanwhile, there's still killers trying to get Nathan. So it's it was... Uh, it was my first book. It did stunningly well around the world, and it, it launched a career. Well, I have to tell you, just recently that book was re-released, and so I got it on my Kindle at, where I can keep it forever because um, I've now read it four times. <laughs> you also wrote the trilogy um, that I want you to talk about, too. So can you tell, us, tell listeners and viewers about the trilogy that you wrote? I haven't written a trilogy. I am writing a, a, the the Crimson Phoenix series, Victoria Emerson nope. series, will be a trilogy. You wrote something else. You wrote something else back. I, uh, I let me go. Let me go look on Amazon under your name. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were four. There were four books, standalone ah. novels, before Six Minutes to Freedom, which is a nonfiction, and then after that, it became Jonathan, pretty much straight out. So those first books, you know, I've always dealt with. Um, well, actually, the Times of London said Gilstrap writes a thriller with a heart, which I've always I've always thought was very nice. Um, they're about family, about individuals, they're about characters yep. that are going through horrific things. Often, I think the Grave series is the first time that I've created a character that is actually uh, trained for doing the stuff that he does. Most people yeah. just kind of stumble into it. Uh, so those books, the first book, let's see if I can do this. It was Nathan's Run at All Costs, which is where we first meet Irene Rivers. Right. Um, and then even Stephen and Scott Free were the, those are the first four standalones. I think I have all those too on my shelf. I have a bill strap <laughs> shelf in, in my library. I have a, my second bedroom is dedicated to a library. So on the gill strap shelf, along with my coins, I think I have all of those books on there. Um, so uh, here, here I'm going to log into Amazon so I can see if I can remember on my trusty little phone, which is not an iPhone, to see if I can remember which series I'm talking, which group of books. John, I'm going to miss seeing you this year. It's been a couple of years since we saw each other in person. And um, I really wish that next year we get a chance to, to hook up and talk again. Oh, I'm sure so, we will. I'm so sure we will. just to tell you, Stealth Attack just came out, and it's already got like well over 250 five-star reviews. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. It's that is pretty good, well. actually. <laughs> it's doing really good, you know? It works for me. Yeah. Um, I'm looking against all enemies and get no, see, just you just have too many books for me to find. I'm gonna have to do it later. I'll Go post all my favorite books in in uh, later on on there. Um, I want to ask you something about about your when you write. You said you know you kind of lock yourself up in your room and uh, you just play with your imaginary characters and you write write these stories. Um, what is the most important tool in your writer's toolbox? You mean literally or? I don't know. Um, I'm a reader, not a writer. <laughs> I Time to concentrate more than anything else. But I can write, you know, I used to have, I was, a lot of my books I wrote while I had a big boy job, you know, and, and I would 
constantly traveling and oh, you know it, it was uh um so a lot of my books have been written quite honestly sitting at a bar with with a pen and a notebook um sitting in restaurants seeing airplanes airports wow. um so i can kind of write anywhere in fact I, I think i mentioned that we're in the process of, of moving and when we were looking for the, the short-term apartment where we can stay in between, one of the things that I know that I can't sit in a small room in an apartment that's not mine and and do everything I need to do. So I always look for escape spaces. So as long as there is a business center or even poolside where I can go and I can sit, what I need is to concentrate and I, then I can write. I don't need- Interesting. Don't need you don't need peace and quiet or anything like that. You The, no. the ambient noise doesn't bother you at all. No. Interesting. Do you write in longhand generally, or do you go right to your computer when you start writing? Generally, it's it's on my computer, but probably, I don't know, 15, 20% of the books are written longhand. What will happen is I'll get into a scene. I'm not sure what I want to do with it, or I'm not sure. I don't believe in writer's block, but there are days you show up and you know it's like the the, the the well is empty. So I find that if I then go with a nice fountain pen, it has to be a fountain pen and it has to be a nice I paper. sent you a fountain pen too. You know, you and I are both fountain pen pens. I love fountain pens. And yep. in fact, there are for travel, I don't know who makes this, Varsity. It happens to be sitting here. It's a throwaway fountain pen, which actually has a really good feel to it. Um, I prefer the, you know, I prefer a real one. But anyway, uh, and I find that the process of writing by hand onto paper somehow gets the juices flowing. And I, and I don't understand. I don't understand any of it. Different part of your brain functioning, I think. You know, uh, the same way as reading a book out loud and then reading it silently. I think they're just, they just tick different parts of your brain into gear. So um, do you ever write the last scene before you finish the book? Um, it, not intentionally. I mean, sometimes I will write the last scene and then realize that I haven't earned it or I have to go back and rewrite at the beginning. But no, I don't, I try not to, to jump around. Uh, if only because it's a little like, all right, I got to get through the Brussels sprouts to get to the dessert. I got to earn the dessert. <laughs> and the end, writing the ending is the dessert. That's a great analogy. <laughs> I love that. Page 200 is nothing but Brussels sprouts. <laughs> that's, that's where all the hard work happens. Interesting. Whose book are you reading right now? I am actually reading Eric Larson's The Splendid and the Vile. The Vile. That's the, I mentioned that he was at the book signing. He was right. the last author I saw, had, his, had the book signed by him. His line wrapped outside the library property and down the block for both of his signings. People wanted to see him. I, I, would, don't, I, I don't wonder why. I mean, yeah. he's, he's really, he's one of the writers I read and he depresses me because I know I can't do that. You know, yeah, I can but, tell a good story. I cannot do what he does. He's yeah, but you know brilliant. something? I can't read his book in one sitting. And well, they're, not. they're a thousand pages. Yeah, but even the ones that aren't a thousand, I mean, I can read a thousand in one sitting, trust me, but it doesn't do the same thing to, it, that reading one of these does. So so don't even think that. They're all different. All the books are different, you know, whether I'm, because I read across genre. The only thing I don't read is anything historical. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I can read romance and, and science fiction and fantasy and everything and be just as happy. You know, uh, I'm happy reading a book. I, I read 400 books a year, so you know, I'm happy doing that. I know it's crazy, but don't forget, I don't have a. I'm, I'm my own meme. I'm a 66 year old woman with four cats and no TV. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. John, tell us who you want to get a shout out to before we get, let you go. Um, first of all, everybody who who took time out in their day to watch this. And I guess anybody who tunes in later, thank you very much. Thanks for all the support. Um, you know, you build a career over a long time and you build it one book at a time. And I cannot stress how important every single reader is, especially given all of the competition that's out there for your time. So I genuinely appreciate it. Oh, gosh, I love having you on. I love talking to you. It's always interesting. You know, and I get to find out when the next book is out and I'm on your your reader list. So, you know, I know your publicist. That helps. <laughs> that helps, too. I oh, and JohnGillsCraft.com. I think it's it's, it's, it's early it's, online. Right. We're going to um, talk about that. And I want to also mention you have a YouTube channel. Tell I do. About, tell us about what you do on YouTube. 
it's called a writer's view of writing and publishing. And I think there's like 30 videos up there now. They're relatively short. And it's kind of an inside, all the questions you get from people, not so much where your ideas come from, because I don't know, but you know, how do writers get paid? How do movie rights work? Um, what is writer's block? How do you get rid of writer's block? How do you deal an agent with an agent? Do you need an agent? You know, those kind of inside baseball kinds of, of, of things. And um, it's John Gilstrap. It's author John Gilstrap will get you there uh, all right. on, on a Facebook search. Uh, right. yeah, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll put all that all over. Uh, before I let you go, does anyone have any comments? Anybody want to write in any questions for John? Because he's a busy man, and I've already kept him for longer than I than I promised him. He has to go pack up boxes. And well, let me tell you what happens next in my life oh, after we drop this. It, what yes. is it? It's about five o'clock local time right now. At mm -hmm. six o'clock, I will have. Ever since the pandemic started, Jeffrey Deaver, Revis Wortham, and I get together on Wednesday nights at six for a happy hour. So that's that's the, the my busy life for this evening. There's your your Zoom happy hour, right? Exactly. Well, tell the guys I said hello. I will indeed. And, and thank you so much for being with me. It's been a lot of fun. It's always thank, fun with you. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. And little, uh, listeners and viewers, thank you so much for being with me. And thank you, Mom and Dad. I'll see you again real soon. Bye.